The World War II interest community among young people in recent years is something that has been increasingly, some would argue alarmingly, synonymized with anime. Particularly among the enthusiasts of the weaponry and technology in the period, guns, planes, especially ships, and of course, tanks. This is a phenomenon that started to really take off in the 2010s, with the expansion of fandoms along the likes of Girls on Panzer, Kankers, and Azure Lanes, but today I'm going to be talking about the tanks of an anime franchise, well, a game series, but also got an anime, and it is presented in that general style. Which which could be argued as one of the early adopters of the World War II inspired anime moeification formula. Valkyria Chronicles. Whilst not directly set in World War II, it does take heavy inspiration from the conflict and the technology of the time. This video will focus more on the tanks, but to quickly explain the lore of the universe for the sake of giving background to those unfamiliar, it is a Romana clay universe that focuses on the continent of Europa, which as it unsubtly implies is based on Europe, which is divided between East and West who are at odds with each other over the increasing scarcity of their literally magical unobtainable energy source of Ragnite. Literally magical, as not only does it fuel their machines, but it's also integral to this universe's magic. In terms of the nature of the conflict in the series itself, the European War II in which all but the second game takes place in, despite its name, aesthetics, and certain events taking place being inspired from the Second World War, it's actually much more closer to a NATO versus Warsaw Pact scenario, but with a level of technology of the late 30s and early 40s. But aside from that, the games also contain heavy aesthetic cues taken from time periods all over the place, be it from the medieval era, 18th to 19th century Europe, and 2555 UNSC. This video in particular will focus on the tanks of the Eastern European Imperial Alliance, which plays the role of the war pack in this scenario, but instead of being communists, they are an amalgamation of World War II-era Germany, the Soviet Union, and a mix of conservative monarchies from the turn of the 20th century. Basically, not too far off from something you'd expect a teenage Kaiserreich or TNO fan to conjure up. Again, for the sake of those unfamiliar with the franchise, before we get into the actual vehicles, there are some general trends that need to be pointed out. First is the aforementioned Ragnite, which fuels the vehicles and is highly volatile, which which requires tanks to have these special radiators that presumably work by circulating the liquid ragnoline. These are an almost always exposed segment at the rear of the vehicle, with some exceptions, and when they get shot at by a weapon of sufficient caliber, it will usually guarantee a one-hit kill. From a game design perspective, this was likely done to simplify the real-life phenomena of tanks having weaker rear armor, making them more vulnerable to hits from there. The second universal trend that I think should be noted is that high explosive shells do not work in the same way that we would be familiar with. Instead, tanks fire these low-velocity Ragnite explosives, usually out of separately mounted mortars. While some tanks' guns have the ability to shoot these, there are vehicles that need a separate mount for a mortar or have their main gun replaced with a dedicated HE slinger. But for gameplay purposes, with the exception of the Imperial Heavy Tank, these will usually be shown being shot out from the main gun. And finally, it seems to be a universal trend in this universe that tanks have one-man turrets. I guess since the main characters are all tank commanders, it's easier to have them only have to interact with one person in their tank during the story rather than develop an entire crew. Which which would have been an entirely new character dynamic that would have had to be developed on top of the ones with the characters that the story is focused on, and they do try to partially explain it by saying autoloaders already exist in the universe, but historically speaking such turret arrangements were inefficient as the commander would be overworked. Even nowadays with autoloaders and advanced fire control systems, turreted AFVs still have a separate commander to direct the vehicle. In the Valkyria design archives, the art book of the first game, one of the artists Tabayashi jokingly comments that Vulcan is so superhumanly perfect at everything that they are confident that Vulcan is able to handle both directing the tank, aiming the gun, and commanding the rest of the platoon. Finally, with that all being said, let's look at the tanks themselves and talk about their designs and discuss some of the observable historical inspirations behind them. The tanks in Valkyria are usually what I like to call chibi-fied, squashed up proportions with some exaggerated features. But whilst they are not carbon copies of historical vehicles or even components of set vehicles, they do mirror and share strong inspirations for them quite a lot. In the original game, the Imperial tanks were a mix of interwar tanks with some slight leaning towards Soviet influences and combined with with some inspiration from World War II era German designs as well. But by the fourth game, these designs lean solidly towards a wartime Soviet inspiration. Let's take a look. We may be small, but we're fast. According to the Valkyria Chronicles design archive, the light tank was inspired by the Soviet BT series. Whilst it does have some features reminiscent of the BT series, such as its nose and how its main gun is said to be 45mm, from there however the similarities end, as it seems to be more of an amalgamation of different features inspired by various light tanks from the interwar era. For one, it lacks the distinct Christie suspension with the large road wheels and internally mounted springs, but instead its suspension consists of externally mounted bogies. Offset on the front of the vehicle is the separate turret housing 
the mortar. Separate turrets, even on light tanks, were not uncommon, usually housing a machine gun rather than a mortar. But regardless, this further removes the tank away from the BT inspiration, which lacked a second position in the hull, let alone an entire additional turret. And the topic of additional turrets gives us a nice segue to the next tank we're gonna have a look at. Multi-turret and medium tanks were not an uncommon idea in the internal war period. Whilst the Soviet T-28 would likely be the first to come to mind, after all, it is a tank of such style that saw the most publicity and combat. But again, other than using the same main gun caliber of the T-28, the hull and running gear of the Imperial medium tank when the side skirts are removed are more in line with that of the Vickers medium, particularly with its outline steadily inclining downwards towards the rear. Additionally, the tank has another machine gun turret facing the rear of the vehicle in a manner similar to that found on the Neubauer Fahrzeug. The Soviets were fond of rear-facing machine guns for defense against infantry. However, they were usually mounted on the rear of the main turret rather than having a separate rear-facing turret. The medium tank is also where we start to see different turret variations, which range from the standard gun, a flamethrower, and a dual heavy machine gun variant. This is also a good time to discuss a common misconception. Whilst it is often discussed among tank enthusiasts that the Neubauer Farzoi has been confused as a heavy tank when in actuality it was a medium or more accurately a support tank designed for a role like that of the early Panzer IVs, what is less discussed is how, conversely to this, the T-28, whilst often being said to be classified as a medium tank in media such as video games and in the Wikipedia, in service any mention towards medium was only in regards to weight. Its doctrinal classification was actually a quality reinforcement tank of the tank reserve of the Supreme Command quality reinforcement tank for short, and from a position of doctrine, it would effectively function as a breakthrough tank rather than a maneuver vehicle that would characterize what we nowadays associate with a quote-unquote medium tank. Alright, so so far we have a tank that is allegedly based on the BT series, a tank that resembles the T-28. You'd expect following this trend, we will get to a tank that's inspired by the T-35 or the Vickers Independent, right? Well... Hey! Yeah? What the hell is this? The heavy tank is an unwanted illegitimate child of a Char B1 and a Sturm Tiger. It is quite literally a box with a turret slapped on it and a bigger gun crammed into the hull. It has the iconic Char B1 style of weapons configuration with a smaller anti-tank gun in the turret and mounting a larger support gun in the hull. But the actual appearance of the hull mount itself is closer to that of the Sturm Tiger than the Char B1. Also like the Sturm Tiger, it carries the wide boxy frame, its chassis uses the iconic interleaving row wheels of many German late war vehicles, and also features a crane for moving ammunition. All these features combined makes it look like a jury rigged construction vehicle rather than something designed specifically for a battlefield. But anyways, if you were sad about how this unusual pairing turned out, don't worry, they'll try again, give it some 20,000 years and some tutoring from Uncle KV2, and you'll get the Lehman Rust Demolisher. The only variant of the heavy tank we see in the game is a flamethrower variant which not only replaces the turret gun with the flamethrower but also installs an incendiary mortar mounted vertically in the hull. There was a German flamethrower modification of captured Char B1s, however this replaced the hull mount rather than the gun in the turret. But as far as the heavy tank in lore is concerned, I don't think it's unreasonable to assume that other variants would exist. The chassis is also said to be intentionally modular for the sake of keeping production costs low, which has also likely allowed the chassis to be adapted into serving as a base for other vehicles. This of course also has the added benefit of bringing a degree of parts familiarity between different vehicles. The next two vehicles are such that were derived from the heavy tank chassis, starting with the Imperial Tank Destroyer, a casemate vehicle which, as the name suggests, has the role of being used as a self-propelled anti-tank gun. Not an uncommon practice in in the mid 20th century as it allowed a larger gun to be mounted on a smaller chassis and also having the advantage of lowering the vehicle's silhouette which gives it a slight edge in the field of concealment and ambushes which they would be frequently used for. The casemate strongly resembles that of the Yak Panther with the prominent sloping glacies, the sides that also slope inwards, and a roof that is also slightly inclined. However, according to the design archives referenced earlier, apparently there was supposed to be heavier influence from Soviet casemate tank destroyers, but other than the offset gun that is stated to be 85mm, I honestly don't see it. The shape of the casemate and the length of the crew compartment in relation to the engine deck is quite different from the style of Soviet casemate tank destroyers of World War II. Too. Combined with the interleaving road wheels inherited from the heavy tank chassis, any intended connection to Soviet designs get quickly obscured. 
Okay, now we get to the point where the vehicles start to lean more distinctly into a Soviet influence. In the first game's art book, the aforementioned Tabayashi says they feel that the Imperial tanks have a strong Soviet flavor and even alleged to have based the light tank on the BT series and the tank destroyer on the SU-100 and SU-122. However, as we have seen, other than the gun calibers and maybe there can be a case to be made for the medium tanks since the Vickers medium is not as well known, there isn't much clearly Soviet about them, with German design trends arguably being more prevalent. If we are Talking from a purely aesthetic perspective, my theory is that they associated multi-turrets with Soviet tanks, which whilst they weren't the only ones to do so, they were arguably the most prolific users, which I still find a little odd since if you ask most people vaguely familiar with tanks what a Soviet style tank would be, they'll probably say the usual low profiles with frying pan turrets, or maybe point towards some World War II designs. The other theory I have is that they weren't talking about it based on appearances, but rather from like a lore perspective, where Imperial tanks from an in-universe perspective are more rudimentary, designed to be mass-produced, and seemingly less sophisticated, but I'm not sure if I'm entirely confident on that theory as well. Regardless, from VC3 onwards, the new Imperial tanks actually have clear Soviet inspirations. Whilst it is another vehicle in lore that is based on the heavy tank chassis, retaining the iconically German interleaving road wheels, the hull and turret of this tank are unmistakably KV-1 inspired. Its turret consists of a primary 85mm gun with a coaxial 45mm, similar to that of the early KV prototype, albeit with an 85 instead of a 76. The turret also features bolted on armor which was used to up armor some KV-1s, although ironically, as the shackle is a lighter and much more mobile derivative of the heavy tank, this somewhat vaguely mirrors the development of the KV-1S, which actually did away with much of the add-on armor of the previous iterations. This tank also has a unique detail modeled in the form of an optical rangefinder. The shackle however at the end of the day is still more of a unique vehicle, and most of the mainline Imperial tanks featured were the same ones from Valkyria Chronicles 1. This however would change for good in VC4 with the introduction of the next vehicle. C-34, crude, loaded and ready. With the all-round sloping armor, its turret shape, and its front and center in-game reveal, we now land at the vehicle inspired by none other than the T-34. Here, the most notable difference from its IRL counterpart is how its suspension seems to have been changed to a torsion bar with return rollers rather than the slack-tracked Christie suspension with larger road wheels. A similar change in suspension was planned for the potential T-34M, however, unfortunately, the German invasion quickly threw a wrench in that project. Subsequent prototypes of vehicles that were intended to succeed the T-34 whilst incorporating tours and bar suspensions continued with slack tracks on larger road wheels. Going back to the turret, whilst shaped on the style of the early T-34s, the assault tank has a single cupola with a two-piece hatch. Such a combination of early T-34 with a cupola is not completely ahistorical, however, as the Germans who famously installed cupolas on their captured T-34s modified even captured early T-34s into such configuration. These would usually be Panzer III cupolas that would be placed over the pre-existing one-piece hatches. The lore behind the assault tank contains some references to some very old myths and tropes surrounding the T-34, which among tank enthusiasts have been long dead, but you will find some people here and there who will pretend like these are still alive on a meaningful scale among tank enthusiasts for some easy actually points by beating a dead horse. Basically the equivalent of a post on r slash unpopular opinion. These are the ideas that the T-34 was only deployed part way through Operation Barbarossa and that the T-34 was the first tank to incorporate sloping armor. The latter is odd even from a lore perspective as existing Imperial tanks already already incorporated the design, and the Sherman in the universe actually came before the T-34. Additionally, it is also said in the previous game that the sloping armor on the Edelweiss, a tank from the previous war, was considered pioneering. The assault tank is also able to receive the same special weapons as the medium tank, like with the heavy tank from earlier. Unlike the real-life flamethrower variants of the T-34s, the flamethrower assault tanks have their turret weapon replaced rather than their hull mount. Whilst the 76mm on the T-34 is praised for being a multi-purpose gun capable of dealing with armor and at the same time, shooting HE at soft targets, the default gun in the setting does not have HE capabilities when equipped, however only the variant with the gun replaced with the mortar can shoot HE in the game. Such a mount was actually something that was suggested on the T-34 where a 120mm or a 152mm mortar would replace the F-34 gun, but this seems to be something that has never left the drawing board. The assault tank also has a variant with an improved AT gun that uses a smaller round than the default weapon but with a longer barrel at higher velocities, an upgrade remnant innocent of that with the T-34s with 57mm guns. Do not shoot an IS-2.
The ironic thing about me using these Company of Heroes 2 voice lines is that there were some official skins released in the game in celebration of the VC remaster, I believe, that gave the Soviets the Galleon skins and the Germans the Imperial ones. This was before VC4 was released and it would have been very tone deaf to give the actual World War II Germans a good guy faction skin set. Anyways, from the KV-1 and T-34, we finally make it to the IS-2, bringing to bear a 122mm gun, the largest mounted on any standard Imperial tank in the game, and boasting the highest defensive characteristics of those tanks as well. When idle in game, the turret is placed with the gun facing rearwards, and is briefly traversed forwards when engaging with the main gun, with the lore stating the gun is too heavy that keeping it forward for too long would risk destabilizing the vehicle. This is a somewhat derpy adaptation of the real-life dilemma which stems from the barrels having a large overhang, especially on tanks with turrets located further forward from the center of the vehicle. This resulted in them needing to be turned backwards to be locked down during transportation or have the turret be maneuvered into favorable angles when in conditions where the barrel could risk getting damaged. This phenomenon is not unique to the IS-2 or even Soviet vehicles, as the T-3485 and many Cold War Western tanks also had guns that stretched beyond the hull that needed to be locked in a rearward position during travel. Obviously, if a tank had to do this in combat, it would be incredibly inconvenient and nauseating for the crew, even if we could assume that it had something like a counter-rotating capsule that kept the person in the turret facing where they wanted to face regardless of where the gun was pointing. The crew would also need to take into account giving space for the long barrel to spin around when positioning their vehicle in combat. In game however this doesn't have much of an impact as it is turn based, the barrel can clip through objects, and the turret effectively snaps onto the target instantaneously. Like with many IRL Soviet vehicles as mentioned earlier, including the IS-2, the ultimate tank is equipped with a rear facing machine gun in the turret, which in game effectively acts as the coaxial weapon on other vehicles for interception fire when idle. It is said that the tank was designed with a hard weight limit of 45 tons. This actually reflects how weight reduction was a key consideration that was taken into account during the development of the IS-2, stemming from the experience with its KV-1 predecessor, which throughout its development, production, and service, continued to see its weight climb. This had consequences on its performance and reliability that would have had to be avoided in its successor. I also want to briefly talk about the names of these tanks. The assault tank is given the name Kaffir, after the carapace of a beetle, the name of the KV-1 equivalent translates to Jackal, and the ultimate tank is called Ubatis, which is the specific name of a cheetah. On a cursory glance, these seem to be odd names to be given to tanks, especially heavy tanks, which historically are inclined to be more grand and intimidating, with some exceptions of course, or named after famous individuals. I guess Jackal makes sense from an inlord perspective, as it was supposed to be a faster version of the heavy tank, and Lupus was already taken. The IS-2 being a cheetah is like, huh? I guess something like Ursa this would have been too on the nose, but again, cheetah? Anyway, speaking of lupus... On all levels except physical, I am a wolf. Okay, so the wiki says this is based on the IS-2, but I swear this is just someone making some extrapolations based on the fact it had a 122mm gun and that this is a vehicle from the first game where the Empire hadn't received an explicitly IS-2 inspired vehicle yet. But yeah, other than the gun caliber, I don't see it. It's got the interleaving road wheels and the turret is moved to the rear of the vehicle with the engine presumably in front, although the radiator is at the rear of the vehicle which could suggest an arrangement similar to that of the Covenanter. Regardless, both of these are very not IS-2-esque features. The turret also does not look particularly IS-2, having the conical mantlet that is more common in many German vehicles rather than the Soviets. Continuing with the topic of tanks with unconventional engine layouts, we have our next vehicle. An elephant tank destroyer is ready to be deployed. An elephant tank destroyer is ready to be deployed. The Vulcan is essentially the elephant if the casemate was a turret, had a Kugelblitz turret mounted on the front step of the hull and given to Guy Fieri. Like the elephant, the engine is mounted towards the front of the vehicle, between the front and rear crew compartments, but unlike on the Lupus, the radiator is placed directly above where the engine is presumably mounted. Other than the boxy casemate now turned turret, it has the running gear distinctly mirrored from that of the VK4501. However, unlike the elephant, its slopes are much more pronounced. Likely this was done to give it a more sleeker appearance to match the personality of the operator and reflect its in-game automotive traits, which are, well, somewhat detached from its IRL inspiration to say the least. 
I won't talk about most of the landship bosses in the game since these are almost entirely out of fantasy, which may have some historically inspired components but not enough to dedicate an entire segment about, with the exception of the Lophius, which just so happens to be heavily inspired by my favorite tank of all time, the Object 279, with its unique hull shape and the quad tracks, but enlarged and its rear extended and hybridized into a submarine. The Lophius was made to be somewhat of a latch stitch resort measure, with the capability of surviving the blast of a Valkyria bomb if worse came to worst. Whilst the Object 279's ability to withstand nuclear explosions have been misunderstood and often exaggerated, this is still a good nod to its inspiration that also makes sense within the context of the story as well. So these have been the tanks of the Eastern European Imperial Alliance from Valkyria Chronicles. I hope you enjoyed and found a look into some of the historical inspirations and parallels interesting. I may do more of these videos for the rest of the factions in the franchise, but the problem there will be I need to replay through the games to show how the tanks evolve as they upgrade. I chose to do the Imperial tanks first as not only can I do it without replaying, but it also takes inspiration from a wider range of vehicles, including some of my personal favorite tanks in history. I was quite surprised no one had done this kind of video at the time I was initially writing, and as of uploading, there was only one other channel who uploaded a video about some of the tanks of the franchise earlier this year. I also may make some videos about the franchise as a whole, as it is something that I've put a decent amount of time into. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you all again soon.